Um, <laughs> welcome, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Bunky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Uh, we're delighted this morning to uh, welcome back a very dear friend of ours and a man who really needs no introduction, Dr. David Chang. Dr. Chang is the Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and a Professor of Surgery, as well as the Director of the Microsurgery Fellowship at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm just going to uh, do a quick background uh, summary with uh, regards to Dr. Chang's accomplishments before we hand it off to him. Um, Dr. Chang was a Bunky Fellow back in the early 90s, in 1993 to 1994, so he's part of the Bunky family. Um, he was the 2005 ASRM Godina Fellow. Uh, he subsequently, 13 years later, became the ASRM president. Um, and last year, he was the ASRM uh, Bunky Lecturer, which obviously is uh, uh, almost like a Lifetime Achievement Award, if you will, uh, for ASRM. He is our current WSRM president, um, and uh, he is also a member of our very own Harry J. Bunky Society. He is known internationally um, for his work in lymphedema surgery, head and neck cancer reconstruction, um, as well as breast re reconstruction. As I mentioned, Doc, Dr. Chang is uh, our most recent Bunky lecturer, and here he is after his uh, fantastic address um, this past January when we could actually travel. Uh, it, was an, it was an amazing talk, and we actually had the pleasure of, of hosting him in person here, and this is him with Dr. Bunky, um, actually in front of a painting of uh, Harry Bunky, which you see back here. Um, and this was right after he did, delivered his Harry J. Bunky um, lecture to us. Um, I've had the privilege myself of visiting Dr. Chang on a couple of occasions. Uh, this was during my travels last year, and uh, and he is uh, not only a, a phenomenal uh, surgeon, but but an incredible host. Um, and it was really an incredible time. He set up a fantastic dinner at um, uh, at a, a Korean barbecue, which was which was amazing. Um, also, uh, the year before, he actually hosted me at his house as well. And and during the ASRM Council meeting, um, I had the privilege of stopping by Chicago again and sharing some of our experience with the with the Bunky Clinic. Um, he, uh, I had the the pleasure of actually serving on ASRM Council uh, when Dr. Chang was um, was president, and so that was really a, a great experience for me to essentially uh, uh, learn from him, not only from a surgical standpoint but also um, from a society standpoint. Uh, so with that, David, thank you so much for being with us. It's really an honor to have you, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be back here uh, with this uh, Bunky uh, webinar uh, series that you guys are doing. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, I have heard, heard so many good news. People are just uh, so appreciative of uh, your, all your work and effort you're putting uh, to help them be educated. So thank you so much. And uh, should I go ahead and share? Yeah, go ahead and share your desktop with us and we'll get started. Okay. Great. And I'll ask everyone uh, who's viewing to uh, please keep your microphones and your webcams off during the talk. Thank you. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So um, today I want to talk about uh, bone reconstruction with vascularized bone flaps. Now I I do essentially all cancer reconstruction. I would say except for time to time I do a uh, trauma, you know, trauma, I live, we are a level one trauma center. So if I'm on call, I will do some trauma. Uh, and the most of my uh, practice is uh, cancer related reconstruction, uh, breast reconstruction, uh, lymphedema, and then head and neck. But other area that I've always been interested, I think mainly because of my training at Bunky Clinic, uh, uh, at the time we were doing mainly just uh, mostly hand and the upper and lower extremity reconstruction. And uh, I trained uh, at Bunky Clinic uh, where that's what we did mostly. And uh, that has always remained a uh, uh, strong part of uh, uh, my interest. So vascularized bone flaps. These are more commonly used vascularized bone flaps that uh, that are used for various different indications, iliac crest, scapula. But I, I, I like fibula. It's the flap that I, I would say I would use uh, almost always, except for a few exceptions. I think there are many advantages of fibula flap. Uh, as you know, it's a long bone. Uh, it's a segment of blood supply allows us to do osteotomies and shape it into various different uh, uh, shapes that are necessary. Uh, you can take skin with it. Uh, it's very reliable bone. 
Donor side is typically pretty minimal. Patients can uh, ambulate without uh, much difficulty. Uh, and for a lot of reconstructions, particularly for like head and neck, you can do simultaneous harvest. So you can save a lot of time rather than say like scapula where you have to turn the patient over. So for these uh, advantages, uh, I would say I do fibula flap uh, over 90% of time unless the patient is a vasculopath and you, you can't do anything for the, take anything from the leg. So this is a patient I saw recently. Like I said, you know, we are level one trauma center. So we get, this was during the COVID. Uh, only time when we did anything was when the, there was a something like this, gunshot wound to the uh, mandible, essentially uh, uh, blew off the anterior portion of mandible through and through defects. So we took them to the OR Friday uh, and then just washed them out, debated whatever we can, got a uh, 3D, uh, and here's another view you can see and uh, um, got a 3D uh, imaging. Uh, and then we did a little virtual modeling. One of my colleagues has a 3D printer. He printed out a little model. Uh, and then uh, uh, Monday or Tuesday, uh, a few days later, we took him back to the OR and did the, he's a very heavy man, uh, about 350 pounds. We were able to get a fibula with the two skin panels. We need the, I need a tissue for the intraoral defect as well as external. There was a strip of a lower lip that was still intact, so we, we, uh, we saved that. And then I did the fibula uh, and uh, put the skin pedal for intraoral reconstruction. Yeah, it looks very thick there, but it did fit. <laughs> I had to trim it down a little bit. And then the uh, other pedal for the external defect using the uh, facial artery and the vein as the recipient vessels. And then he did it quite well. Here is a couple days later, uh, post-op showing the uh, reconstruction of the mandible. And uh, actually, uh, uh, he was able to go home. Uh, he was on suicide watch, so we had to uh, get a psychiatrist involved and all that. But as soon as we got that resolved, he was able to go home. And in fact, he is uh, uh, eating regular diet right now. And uh, I just saw him and we'll have to bring him back. Uh, probably have to do some debulking, uh, particularly intraorally. But uh, when we talk about uh, vascularized bone reconstruction, it is it has mainly been used uh, for uh, head and neck reconstruction, such as mandible. Here's another anterior mandible resection, but this is more in a control setting in a cancer patient. Here, as we mentioned, here's a fibula bone with a skin paddle. And then you can do osteotomies and then shape it to look like a mandible. You can put a plate on, on the leg uh, ahead of time. That's how I used to do it in the past. Now I do a little bit differently. Uh, but uh, and then we transplant the bone and the plate to do the bony reconstruction first, followed by followed by a soft tissue reconstruction, and then do the microvascular anastomosis. Uh, and here is the uh, heavy mandibular uh, reconstruction. And this uh, this is a young man. Actually, he was a football player in college, and a big guy. And you can see the incision here where they split the lip for the resection. And uh, Reconstruction demonstrates uh, excellent occlusion. This is six weeks, and now he's able to start to uh, do his uh, have a, a diet. Uh, and uh, here's a soft uh, defect. Well, this moved really fast by itself. What happened here? Another uh, patient. This is uh, one of my earlier patients. This is before we did the virtual image, uh, virtual uh, imaging and planning. But you can see the uh, the defect. She had a maxillectomy defect at outside hospital. You can see the orbital dystopia, and the, uh, she's having double visions, and uh, obviously the, the, the deformity is causing her uh, distress. Here's a uh, uh, CT showing the uh, absence of maxilla. So without the virtual imaging, I just use a contralateral cheek as a model to take a fibula, and then I bent a plate using a contralateral uh, cheek as a model, and then I just, uh, as, a, as a mirror image, and then did the osteotomies, took a skin paddle, and then reconstruct a defect. And here, a uh, bone has been placed intra, uh, for the uh, orbital floor and then brought the orbit back up to uh, the level that it should be. And then I use the skin for the soft tissue reconstruction and then uh, extend down to facial artery and the vein for uh, anastomosis. And here, just after the single operation, uh, significant improvement. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall I, I ever had to do any revision on her. Uh, this was a long time ago. I don't think she can, uh, she didn't want anything. She was happy with the uh, initial operation. Now, when we look at the literature, the first use report of vascularized bone flap in human 
was 1975 by Ian Taylor uh, in the uh, uh, in this journal PRS. It's titled "The Free Vascularized Bone Graft." Free vascularized bone graft. So when I saw this paper, I was a little bit surprised at the use of the term graft, but it's not it's not a graft, right? It's a vascularized it's a vascularized flap. And uh, actually, if I remember correctly, and, and Greg and Bob, uh, Bobby can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Dr. Bunky did not, Harry Bunky did not like the term. I think he, he preferred the term transplantation. He would always say it's a free tissue transplantation. So this is a vascularized bone transplantation. And the two cases he presented were both trauma cases, trauma uh, uh, of a tibia. His first case was a 14 centimeter tibia defect. There was also fracture of the mid fibula. So he took the contralateral fibula, uh, as you can see, and then transplanted and put it as a uh, intramedullary reconstruction. And then uh, they probably they put a rod into the this other fibula. And then it uh, looks like some kind of gastroc flap, maybe a soft tissue reconstruction. Second case was also a tibia. Uh, it was a little more proximal. Fibula was not fractured, so he took the ipsilateral uh, fibula and put it like as an onlay, and then he took a fibula from the contralateral leg and then transplanted it like as an intramedullary reconstruction. So today I want to talk to you about use of vascularized bone flap for extremity reconstruction in sarcoma patients. So again, this is one area that I've had a lot of interest in uh, through my uh, career. Uh, Unfortunately, the incidence of sarcoma, actually it's fortunate, is not that common, it's pretty rare. So uh, this is a bit of an old data, but I don't think it's really changed that much. Soft tissue sarcoma, maybe about 10,000 cases a year in the United States, uh, and for bone, maybe 1,000 cases a year in the United States. And uh, uh, just that I happen to be working at a, one of the tertiary cancer centers, so we were one of the few centers where we saw uh, bulk of sarcoma cases, so I was able to develop a pretty good experience when I was in MD Anderson Cancer Center. Now, traditionally, sarcoma was known to have a very high local recurrence. So radical amputation like these, which I found is in a, some archive journals, were a very common way of treating these patients. And obviously, there's a tremendous functional loss, not to mention the uh, aesthetic loss. Uh, in 1980s, prospective randomized trial demonstrated that limb salvage, when you combine it with adjuvant therapy, uh, that the survival and the local recurrence rate was just as good as if you did these radical resections. So limb salvage became a more of a uh, uh, common way of treating these sarcoma patients uh, to provide a better function and also better quality of life. So this is a case that uh, that I did with uh, uh, orthopedic colleagues. They had resected the proximal uh, humerus and the joint, and they put this uh, prosthesis in. So they just asked us for soft tissue reconstruction. So I did the ipsilateral latissimus dorsi myocutaneous flap to provide a soft tissue. But when there is a these type of bone defects, and the prosthesis and allografts are, are used, the complication rate is very high in these people. Oftentimes, the allografts will not heal or take a long time to heal or never heal. Prosthesis will get infected, exposed, because most of these patients will uh, also have chemotherapy as well. So the, the role of vascularized bone flap in this uh, situation is that it facilitates bone uh, healing, particularly in patients who are uh, immunocompromised because of chemo and radiation. Uh, it also helps uh, patients to maximize their function and aesthetic uh, return. And there's four, uh, three areas that I wanna talk to uh, discuss today, how the vascularized bone flap is used in these patients. One is to treat non-union of allograft that have already been placed. Second is to use it during the primary bone reconstruction with or without allograft or as a growth plate transfer, particularly in pediatric patients. And another way is to use it for trunk reconstruction, particularly with the, uh, with the pelvis. So let's talk about non-union of allograft. 
So non-union, depending on the literature you read, uh, can occur anywhere up to 50% of these patients, particularly if they are getting chemotherapy, which is majority of sarcoma patients. And the orthopedic colleagues will often take them back to the OR to modify the fixation. They'll put a bone graft and so forth. And sometimes you can get to heal, but this may take a very long time, two, three years. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, uh, sometimes it leads to amputation. So here is a uh, young uh, woman who has spindle cell sarcoma at the distal femur. And now uh, they had a, we constructed this large allograft and it has not healed. It has not healed. It's been uh, two years, three years. So uh, we opened up the incision, cleaned up the area, took a fibula bone. Uh, I usually take the ipsilateral so that they just have one bad leg. And I placed on as an onlay, and then we fixed it with the uh, uh, plate here. Our orthopedic colleague will put a plate in there. Uh, and then here is a vascular and osmosis performed uh, to a uh, branch. What I often do in case like this is that uh, if there, if it's hard, it's hard to find the spin vessel in this area. So what I do is I will make a counter incision immediately, in this particular case in the, in the femur, thigh, identify the uh, recipient vessel, create a tunnel, and then I put the bone in there uh, and then pass the uh, pedicle. And then once the plate is uh, placed, I will do the myconosmosis and then I close the uh, defect. So here, the diagram demonstrates how the uh, allograft is placed, as you can see, away from the plate and then a counter incision is made and then I will do the anosmosis at a, in a virgin area. So here's the same patient. Uh, at five months now, x-ray demonstrates bone healing, and that this is uh, about three to four years later, demonstrating an excellent bone healing. But as I mentioned, even if you can manage this allograft non-union with vascularized bone flap, sometimes it requires multiple operations, and the patient may not be able to ambulate for quite some time, two, three years. So the idea of using vascularized bone flap for primary bone reconstruction is a very, uh, is, is an excellent one in that uh, you can minimize or prevent allograft non-union even if there is allograft. So here is a very similar defect. This is a young uh, uh, patient with osteosarcoma of distal femur. So here you can, you can see the tumor right here and the resection will include from here to here. And typically, in most places, they are just put allograft in there. So this was first, first uh, uh, populated by Capana in Italy, but this is a kind of modified technique of his. So here's the allograft, and then we create a uh, big enough, we, we uh, 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 clean out the, uh, uh, the marrow so that I can't put a fibula bone inside. You have to you know, do, drill it out. And then for the pedicle, I create a little hole, and I brought the pedicle out like so. Kapana, I think he just takes he takes a, a, this wedge out like that. And then here's a diagram demonstrating how it fits in to the defect with the vascularized bone inside and then with the microvascular osmosis. Again, as you can see here, the, the pedicle goes in the opposite side. So I will find the vessel immediately and then the anosmosis there. And allograft provides a mechanical strength, and the vascularized bone flap provides a biological activity to facilitate bone healing. So here, uh, as six months later, uh, here is a fibula you can see going in there. Here's a fibula going to distally. Now there's a, a demonstration of bone healing, so patients start to do full weight bearing. And this is study done at the at the Kapana, uh, their group. They did it. This is where Marco and Asanti and they were all together and. Uh, this study demonstrated uh, 24 patients who had this approach. And over the years, when they do the sequential X-ray and CT scan, this is our early on, here's the fibula and here's the allograft. Over the years, the fibula continued to uh, hypertrophy and then there's the integration of uh, vascularized bone with the uh, surrounding allograft. This was my early experience uh, published in 2005. Comparing the two groups, the delay, this is a group that uh, uh, non-union patients will reconstruct the, with the uh, online graft, and then six patients who had uh, immediate reconstruction, combining allograft and the 
vascularized bone flap. The main thing here is that the the use of limb, so uh, the ambulation. So if you do vascularized bone at the onset, at the beginning, they can ambulate at a relatively short time, six months. But if you wait until they develop a non-union, and then if you do, do secondarily, even if it's successful, uh, the time to uh, ambulate can be quite lengthy. So here's uh, another uh, patient, 12-year-old osteosarcoma of distal femur. And uh, here, uh, take a fibula bone, nice long fibula, put it into the allograft, brought the pedicle out, and then the reconstruct. And you can see the allograft here, here's a plating, and then the, here's the fibula inside the uh, distal femur, and then in here it's by the knee area, and then microvascular anastomosis done. You can see what's done here because I put implantable doctor right here. And this is at five months, there's some bone healing so that the patient is able to ambulate about a month later. And this is uh, about two, three years later. Showing the healing there. So vascularized bone uh, flap, particularly fibula, have been used to treat allograft, but also prevent allograft non-union to facilitate bone healing and quicker functional uh, return. Uh, now, if you don't need allograft, you can just use a bone flap uh, just for primary bone reconstruction. And this is something you can do for humerus where you do not need a huge allograft. So this is, a again, a child, 80-year-old osteosarcoma, proximal humerus, very close to the growth plate. So we were concerned whether the growth plate could be preserved. Well, we were able to uh, preserve that. And uh, our orthopedic colleague did a resection. And here you can see the, uh, the humerus Humeral head with growth, growth plate within it. This is a distal uh, humerus. It looks very small, but it's all crunched up. So actually, it's a pretty uh, a lot, long defect. Here, the recipient vessels will be dug out uh, near the uh, defect. And here, the vascularized fibula, seven centimeters taken. And then uh, we place it in here. The first x ray uh, was done with the screw, but they didn't, uh, we did not like the fixation. So we took this out and did the interosseous squaring. And here at the four months, the bone healing demonstrates, this is uh, four years later, the bone hypertrophies. And here she is, uh, it's about four years afterwards. Legal angel marker. Yeah, showing her donor site scar. Um, so this is uh, my personal experience of uh, reconstructing uh, pediatric patients for similar defect, 22 pediatric patients for free fibula for uh, free flap or limb salvage. And vascular uh, uh, fibula flap was used in 68% of the cases. And the growth plate was used in about 23% of the cases. And the remainders were some other types of soft tissue flaps. So growth plate transfer. In pediatric patients, if the growth plate is involved, and if you do not replace it, obviously the limb's not gonna grow as it should. So here is a uh, young boy with the Ewing sarcoma left proximal humerus involving the growth plate. So in this kid, he's gonna lose that. So here's a defect, the distal humerus. Here's just the shoulder socket. Now all the rotator cuffs have been removed and tagged, so we can use that to reconstruct it uh, again. And so the defect is 12 centimeters. So here, when you do growth plate transfer, this is a marking we make for the fibula and the uh, anterior to the uh, fibula head. Dissect it down carefully. We use the anterior tibial artery in the vein. Uh, we use the retrograde. And not the not the, not the uh, perineal vessel, and I'll talk about that. So here's a fibula growth, growth plate within the head, and then here's the remainder of fibula, 14 and 5, 14.5 centimeters. So here the bone is placed distally, put a screw in there, and then we use the fibula head uh, into the uh, shoulder socket, and then uh, do the microvascular osmosis. Uh, as you can see, uh, I think it's back here. And then we uh, replace the rotator cuffs. 
I take a biceps femoral uh, tendon with the fibula head, which is used to anchor into the shoulder joint with the MITAC anchor. Uh, and the NSMOs perform the uh, uh, retrograde to anterior tibial artery and the vein. And then we put them on this cast because we don't want uh, we don't want them moving their shoulder until there's healing, and of course the leg too. Uh, thing about pediatric patient is that particularly these boys are very very active, so they won't uh, they just won't sit still, and so until the, everything heals, we have to protect them from themselves. Um, and here the bone has healed well now in three months, so we take him off the cast. And what happens? He he climbs a tree and falls off, and he fractures the uh, fibula, proximally. But because he's vascularized fibula, we put him back on a cast, and he just heals like normal bone. And here it's healed. Uh, and uh, but then he fell again, and then uh, at, at a different site. Not this was our first fracture site. Second site, it's been it's fractured again, and uh, it healed again. So uh, here it looks another year or so later. And now here, three and a half years later, uh, here is an incision, and it's a little bit shorter than the other arm, but uh, nevertheless, it's growing. Here's a scar. He has a little toe contract, which I'll talk about, which can happen in pediatric kids when we take harvest, uh, harvest the fibula bone. So again, Ian Taylor was, uh, he demonstrated the uh, uh, blood flow to the uh, growth plate in 1988 in the injection studies he did with uh, cadavers and inpatients. He showed that the fibula head and the growth plate uh, is perfused by this branch of the anterior tibial vessel. And uh, fibula, I mean, the perineal vessel, which we commonly use, is mainly for the distal two third of the, of the fibula bone. So Inosante, who actually has been the person who had probably the most experience using this, pretty early on 1997 published his earlier experience with 12 children uh, where he used the growth plate transfer. First couple of cases he did, he used the perineal artery and the vein, uh, as he typically do with other fibula, and found that the growth plate closed within four months. So he started to use the anterior tibial in a retrograde fashion and showed that the mean growth rate uh, was over one centimeter a year. So this is from his publication uh, in Journal of Bone uh, Disease, I believe, uh, kind of showing a very nice step-by-step -step of how to do the surgery. And uh, Main thing is that the, uh, you got to preserve this recurrent epiphyseal branch off of the anterior tibial artery that are uh, uh, providing blood supply to the uh, growth plate. So the way to do that is to not dissect into the uh, fibula head, but just leave a cup of muscle where, the, uh, where these branches are, so you protect it. Those are the extensor uh, digitally uh, longus and the uh, perineus longus. And then you want to preserve this uh, perineal nerve which provides a motor branch to the remainder of the muscle. So you dissect this out. Anterior tibial artery and vein is here. Uh, as you can see, you preserve for the uh, diaphyseal branch to fibula. And then you, you pre preserve all the perineal nerve. Very careful, this is very tedious dissection. And you can see here, this is by biceps femoris tendon. You split this in half. You leave this half intact uh, with it at the recipient side and take this half to but this will be used to reconstruct the knee joint, and this will be used to help reconstruct the shoulder joint. As you can see here, you split this like so. So this is a uh, young girl, osteosarcoma of the uh, proximal shoulder. Uh, you can see that. So this is the defect, very similar to the previous case. Again, rotator cuffs are all dissected out, and here's the bony defect, here's a specimen. So we took the uh, growth plate, transferred to fibula, placed screw distally, and then we uh, do a microvascular osmosis, and then we construct a shoulder joint, uh, everything. This is another kid who had a osteosarcoma of the left ulna, had a resection and reconstruction with the cement space for the other institution. Of course, as he grew, Space is not going to grow. So now it's, uh, uh, even ulna is starting to bend, causing this bowing. So uh, he, was, he came to MD Anderson. And then uh, so we took out the spacer. And then uh, we did a, a vascularized fibula with the, uh, bone uh, with the uh, growth plate. You can see it's placed right here distally. 
and then this is fixated with the bone here. And here's dissection here demonstrating this biceps femoris tendon here, fibula head, peroneal nerves all being dissected out, and then anterior tibial vessels. And then we placed in here this four months later, and the the bowing is now gone, and the arms start to uh, grow in a more uh, regular fashion. And here is uh, two and a half years later, uh, showing a good flexion both at the elbow uh, and the uh, growth plate is uh, open. So vascularized growth plate transfer uh, allows us to perform lymph salvage in pediatric patients where growth plates involved to provide a predictable axial growth. It's not as perfect as the normal growth plate, but nevertheless, they do grow some and good functional outcome. Another area that I have been involved in with the trunk reconstruction, particularly pelvic wear. So um, this is an example of a young lady with the recurrent chondrosarcoma of the pelvis. And you can see the scans here. And uh, she received what's called type 1 internal hemipalvectomy. There are different types of internal hemipalvectomy. These are the ones that are easiest to reconstruct. It does not involve the uh, uh, head of the uh, femur. Uh, so here's a defect. Here's the uh, sacred iliac joint, bunch of major nerves. And the, what we do is take a fibula, we turn into two struts, we measure out, we measure out where we're going to put the uh, fibula and struts and then uh, divide the bone uh, accordingly. So it could be nine, it could be 11 or whatever, but that we, this is all done, not just randomly, you have to measure it out. And here's a vascular pedicle. And the, here now bone has been fixated with the orthopedic colleagues coming in and fixating it to where they want to fixate it. And then I come into the microvascular osmosis. The key here to doing, making this easy, and this is something that I found out through experience is that once the bone gets in, trying to get the recipient vessel out, is practically impossible. So after, first thing you should do is go in and get the recipient vessel prepared and make it in a way that it's easily accessible where you can actually do the micro. So it's not like under the, under down in here where you can't really get at. So you gotta plan that out. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll show you what I did with this patient, but here you can see the bone struts being uh, fixated and here again, implantable Doppler placed to, uh, to monitor. So in this particular case, I just use the deep inferior epigastric vessel uh, artery in the vein because it's very superficial, it's right there. I dissected it up and it just turned it down. And then micro, in the microvascular surgery, it's very easy. It's right on superficial area. Some cases I have taken the, I have used the uh, branches of the iliac vessels. If they're relatively uh, like some of these, you can use some of these to do the osmosis. But what you want is you want a relatively superficial where you can do the micro easy. You want to make sure you do very easy. Uh, and you can see we have reestablished a public ring, uh, so it's nice really and well balanced, and allow the patient to walk uh, like as if they didn't have any public resection. And uh, sarcoma is involved in the pelvis about 10% of the time. And when these intraimate pelvics are performed, and if you do not do anything, they can ambulate, but they ambulate with the, what's called a trendelenburg gait, where there's a huge limp. Uh, and uh, you may have seen people walking around with a major limp. And so the goal of reconstruction is to allow them to ambulate normally. So you can see they can run. These are people who have same surgery and they can walk up the stairs. So anyway, now this is a 24-year-old male, osteosarcoma of the right pelvis and sacrum involving the uh, fifth lumbar vertebra, huge resection. They're gonna resect two in two stages. So we did this in two stages. First performed the uh, spine resection. They, they put all this hardware in there. And then the, we brought the patient back uh, uh, next day uh, after being in ICU, I brought him back. They didn't finish till pretty late at night. And then did the right 
external hemipelvectomy, total sacrectomy, and uh, uh, needed a large bone reconstruction straight against the spine. So we harvest the femur based on the uh, iliac vessels here, and then they will remove the uh, remainder of the, uh, when they actually have a product, the remainder of the specimen. And then it's hard to tell here, but uh, I will show you the x-ray, you can see better. Here's a femur fixated into the pelvis. Here's the soft tissue that I, so I did a posterior thigh flap, so I used that to swing over to close the defect. And here's the x-ray showing the femur placed against the spine and against the remaining pelvis and fixated. So this was a pretty cool case. And you can see the femur in there fixated. Um, prior to coming to Chicago, I looked at 10 year uh, experience of uh, doing a vascularized bone flap for these post-oncologic bone defects. And this was published in PRS. Uh, and uh, there were about 19 more trunk, mainly pelvis, lower extremity 21, and upper extremity uh, about 13. And the uh, mean, they're all pretty young patients. I think it's supposed to be BMI. Uh, allografts were used about 40% of the time. What you can see is that the most patients had pre op chemo and post op chemo. Radiation is not that common in sarcoma uh, treatment. So. And then we looked at, again, the, uh, these are the bone healing based on the radio, uh, x-ray finding and the reading by the radiologist. Initial bone uh, bridging occurs around three months, regardless of the uh, si uh, site. But the final bone union seemed to occur uh, earlier with the uh, trunk and the upper extremity compared to lower extremity. And then the uh, full weight bearing uh, is based on the bone healing. Uh, as you can see, it's relatively early in all our patients. And then we looked at the functional outcome. We looked at five out of five, four out of five, five out of five, 90 out of 100, uh, 83 out of 100, four out of five, four out of five, five out of five. Bone union, 94%. Uh, I think that was the one patient where it didn't uh, heal very well. And then a contractor, this in kids, when I take a, a when we take fibula, I guess because the muscle mass is so small, we've had few patients where they developed this toe contracture. And uh, you saw that one kid with that. Uh, so try to, I try to minimize taking those uh, flux, uh, fluxus longus but, uh, uh, as much as I can, but it can still develop. And then there's some of the other uh, uh, issues. Uh, limb length inequality, particularly growth plan transfer, uh, and the uh, you know, range of motion decrease. Some of the uh, pathologic fracture and uh, decrease in strength. But overall, I think the outcome was pretty good. This is a case I did recently. This patient came to see me right at the beginning when, like in March, when we were about to go uh, into COVID uh, lockdown. So this patient was referred to me by a community plastic surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon. The patient had developed a calcaneal fracture. I think he fell off his bike or something. And then developed this osteomyelitis. So they, we debated him numerous times, and now there was a huge bone defect that prevented him from ambulating. So I evaluated him, and then uh, because of COVID lockdown, and also because he was out of network, we had to get insurance approval, we couldn't do anything at the moment. So I put a wound back on it. And then I saw him back uh, actually a few weeks ago, and, I, and then got another imaging, x-rays and CT, and the, the defect was still there, really hasn't healed yet. So I took him to the OR. At this time, now everything's been approved. Uh, DeVito, and here is a defect. Uh, skinhead uh, defect is recreated, and there's huge bone defect in there. The little fibula bone, the skin paddle, and then uh, reconstruct the, uh, I put the KR fixation to fixate the fibula, and then skin for the uh, def uh, soft tissue. Went into anterior tibial because of the tension, I put the skin graft on there. The veins here were very small compared to the VC, so. Uh, I just found the uh, saffron's vein and I just flipped it over here uh, so we can do venous anastomosis with the saffronous. And again, uh, implantable Doppler. I like using implantable Doppler. Uh, I know some people don't, but I like that. Uh, and then here you can see the KY fixation. So he's now about three weeks out. Uh, I just saw him, I think he's going fine. But you know, we're gonna keep getting x-rays to see when the bone healing occurs and then we'll pull the pin out.
So vascularized bone uh, transfer, uh, it facilitates bone healing when it's used as a primary bone reconstruction, preserves growth plate transfer uh, potential uh, when, to, when you reconstruct the growth plate in pediatric patients, and provides quicker and better functional return than say like allograft or other means. And if you ever wonder where the boneless chicken come from, they come from this boneless chicken ranch, probably in Northern California somewhere. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Um, and I love that last slide, by the way, the boneless chicken ranch. <laughs> really good. Um, really, really amazing talk and fantastic Hello. results. Can you hear me? How can I hear you? Um, oh, I'll hear you now. Can you hear me, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Were you able to hear me? Were you able to hear me through the talk? Uh, yes, we could hear it. Okay, okay, okay. I think I muted. Uh, okay. Yeah, Good. perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much for a fantastic talk, amazing results, and I think a really wide spectrum. I mean, you've shown <clears throat> head neck reconstruction, pelvic reconstruction, lower extremity, upper extremity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So really, really good to see. Um, the... I want to make a couple of comments first before I ask a couple of questions, and also we have some um, questions online. First off, we had over 80 viewers uh, from around the world, so I think I'm um, uh, really excited about that. I think it speaks to people obviously wanting to hear your, your wisdom. Um, your comment earlier about vascularized bone grafting, um, I completely agree, and I think it's one of <laughs> one of my pet peeves, and I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to make a motion. Uh, that you as a WSRM president uh, outlaw and ban the term vascularized bone grafting. <laughs> no, that just kills me. I don't know why people use that. <clears throat> yeah, they especially use it all the like, time, especially like someone like Ian Taylor. He should, you know, I mean, that. <laughs> especially in the, in the I hand. Remember Harry, Harry Bunk used to get, he used to really hate that. I, think. I know. I, I want to join into this the discussion because <laughs> it's really a, one of my pet peeves too. And I used to listen to this constantly for my dad. But the whole idea of even transfer is not the right term because yeah, trans it's a transplant, yeah. Transfer, yeah. You know, you're taking tissue, it's just like a transplant. You know, you a heart mm. transplant, lung transplant, kidney transplant. Exactly. You're moving stuff from one body to the other, but we're transplanting tissue from one part of the body to another part of the body. It's really a transplant. And how they came up with the term free flap, it's a cool term. But it's not free for sure, and it's really <laughs> not a flap. I mean, it's it's really a transplant of tissue. So it's a I, transplantation, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we call it we call them microvascular transplants, um, and yep. it's yeah. it's not as cool as free flap, but uh, it's uh, to say at least. But um, I don't know. We still say free flap all the time, but we try to not use the word <laughs> graft. Maybe maybe because that term was uh, coined uh, during 1960s when everything was like very free and hippie. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> it just sounded cool. I think it caught on just because it's easy to yeah. say. Yeah. But yeah, we even today, I mean, our operative notes, you know, we'll say, for example, you know, anterolateral thigh microvascular transplant to the, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. Hand That's what right. I say to my patients too. I say, well, I, I, we, are, we are doing transplantation. I'm doing lymph node transplantation. Right. Uh, that's what I tell them, you know, then they go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. And from a billing perspective, I think it's better too, because it, it demonstrates that it's actually a transplantation that requires two, maybe two operative teams. I mean, I, I think that th it is really a transplant. It transfer assumes or a graft assumes that it's one, you know, it's an easier operation. This is really a transplant. And I think that it might even get us to get paid better. From the billing, uh, from the insurer, from the payers. Well, that'd be nice. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> um, I'm really glad you uh, you commented on Marco Innocenti's um, work. We actually had him give us a talk on um, the obviously the fibula microvascular transplants, um, and his experience definitely mirrors yours. And I think um, the the Capana technique, you know, he was obviously showing uh, great results with that. And I think it's nice to to see that that's a reproducible technique and that uh, your results are also fantastic in that way. He didn't really uh, cover the vascularized epiphyseal transplant. Mm. Um, and so I'm glad that you brought that up. And I know that, you know, we, we have done that. We don't have as many reps um, as, as you have, or definitely as, as, as Marco. And the technique of harvesting that is certainly more challenging, um, particularly with the branches of the perineal nerve. Um, I was, Wondering if you could comment potentially on your experience with the difficulty of harvesting the epiphyseal 
um, flap uh, with regards to the nerve and whether or not you have either temporary or some permanent uh, potential deficits of the donor site. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, if I, I have to kind of, you know, uh, think back, uh, but I think there were a couple of patients where there were uh, temporary, uh, uh, I won't say palsy, but the deficit that eventually mm -hmm. did come back. But it is tedious because the motor branches are, sometimes there are a bunch of them that are smaller and you have to kind of select them. You have to actually cut them to bring the flap out because yeah. it's just the way they cross, you just can't possibly bring the flap out without it. So I guess you can use the nerve, you know, the nerve conduct the testing thing to check which ones they are. But uh, for the most part, you, you know, it is, a, it is a very tedious. And obviously, you know, I do it under, uh, I do it under a tourniquet and the, uh, uh, um that that is a, one of the uh difficulty uh difficult flaps to do but starting proximally making sure that you take leave the cuff of muscles around the uh epiphyseal branches and then find the uh, perineal nerve and dissecting up proximal distally to ensure mm -hmm. it's not damaged but it is not it's a, it's a it's fun up it's a fun operation it's a very tedious but fun operation yeah. and uh um i yeah I, I i enjoy doing that i haven't done it in a while now since i've you know but uh it's one of the flaps that I really enjoyed on. And also your your oh, results. Trans 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 yes. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because, you know, colloquially, we still call it a flap, but um, but technically when we do our optimus, we always yeah. call it a transplant. Yeah. But I think, I mean, you're the, also the results. I mean, you know, you, you've shown these pediatric cases with the, um, where the growth plate is obviously needed and, and also just your videos with people running and walking, running up steps and down yeah. down stairs. I think clearly that's making a huge difference in, in patients' lives. I think one of the comments that you made about the importance of um, uh, getting your recipient vessels out before you inset the bone, I think it's, it's critical. I think it's, you know, with most free flaps, your, um, your, uh, recipient vessels are still accessible um, when you when you insert the flap because the the pedicle may be more proximal. Uh, in these cases, do you ever um, have to do an AV loop or something ahead of time before you bring the flap up and insert it, um, or are you usually just doing kind of a primary anastomosis on these cases? Yeah. So when indicated, I think AV loop is a good thing, and I have used it uh, on few occasions. But I generally, have, I don't use vein grafts that much uh, in any of the constructions. I usually, uh, I usually avoid it. I, I mean, I don't like if I need it, I will do it. But I, mm -hmm. I don't go out of my way not to do it. But uh, I generally will be able to find something more superficial. But there were a couple of cases where, particularly like in the deep pelvis, I really couldn't find any superficial re recipient vessels. Then I, then I bring a, a vein loop. And you do that first, and then you hit this big loop, and then it's very easy to anastomosis at a at a whatever level you want it to be. You know, right. you don't want to be in a deep hole, obstructed with all these different things that where you cannot even make your, you know, you cannot really do any anastomosis. So you don't want to be stuck in the dilemma. So planning it out, in microsurgery, you know, as you know, is if you plan things out and make things easy for you, then things can go well. But if you just kind of do it without thinking, you know, later on go, oh my God, I should have done this first. Uh, yeah, like even even a vein loop, you know, trying to do this vein loop secondarily is much difficult than if you just had it done initially. And, yeah. And it out. So now, with true. regards to uh, you, you you showed an X-ray showing the implantable Doppler cord. Um, obviously, many of these are buried flaps, and so it makes sense to to want to monitor them. I, I'm assuming you're monitoring the artery since the vein on the fibula sometimes yeah. it's it's kind of low flow, and you may not get much of a signal. Is that right? That's correct. I always I always monitor artery regardless. Uh, I have put it in veins. Which actually theoretically is probably better because you know obviously if the artery clots, veins not going to flow. But because of the low pressure in the vein, implantable Doppler uh, uh, may not be as good in picking up the sound. You know when the vein goes collapses down, there's a big space created, and so I, I always put on the artery. Uh, it's not as good as putting it in the vein, but uh, <coughs> at least uh, uh, it doesn't. I, I have had a good experience with in, in, implantable Dopplers, and as you mentioned. In like in a bone flap, if you have bone transplant only, if no soft tissue, the vein goes down, it just bleeds out of the marrow into the whatever. So yeah. uh, it's not it's not as big of an issue. In fact, I think uh, since you bring bring that up, I, I remember um, I was speaking to Jim Jim Urbanic a number of years ago um, uh, at a dinner in North Carolina, and and he was saying that 
in some of their fibula flaps uh, or transplants rather for their their AVN of the hip. Um, they sometimes actually wouldn't even do a vein because they, if it, especially if it was a small segment, um, you know, they would basically say it would just bleed out of the marrow. So they weren't quite sure if, if a, you yeah. know, quote, quote, congestion was the same for a, for a bone. Um, I think the your comment about the implantable Doppler on the vein is is a good one because I think um, in our experience the you know the high flow flaps like muscle flaps tend to have much higher flow within the vein and so it's much easier to hear the signal and when you have a high resistance low flow flap and coupled with a large vein um, you have a lower speed across the anastomosis or across the vein which and Doppler, as we know, when I was a, a fellow, Ru Rudy Buntik would always talk about how Doppler was about speed. It's about speed yeah. of flow, and so, so if you have a you know high resistance, low flow flap with a very large vein, then then it's not easy to hear a venous it signal. It may so be easier to hear. Yeah, it may be easier yeah. to hear. But obviously, with the coupler Doppler, which is on the vein, it's a different story. So I mean, if you yeah, that 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 then they will stay open uh, regardless. But uh, um, yeah, but with the whether the cooked operas that I use, I just put on the other. Yeah. Now we we don't really do sarcoma type stuff here because we don't have the setup or the um the kind of surgical oncology type team. Um, now when you do a a, a basically a, a fibula transplant, um, let's say with a frame and where the patient is is actually weight bearing and and loading the fibula, uh, you expect the fibula to hypertrophy. Uh, yes. With the capona with the capona technique where you place the fibula inside <clears throat> an allograft. Um, my guess is that the fibula doesn't really hypertrophy as much as as it's there to help va revascularize the allograft around it. Uh, is that what you're seeing clinically? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what we see clinically. Also, that you know, that study that I showed you. I know some people uh, may have uh, think that's a little controversial, but it kind of shows how the integration of the fibula bone with the allograft uh, and facilitate the healing. And of course, the fibula is also healing at the proximal and the distal end where it kind of sticks out into a native bone. But, uh, um, you know, we haven't had any patients who have been have any difficulties such as with the uh, fracture or anything like that. Uh, and they can walk very early on. And uh, um, that's the huge advantage of doing it that way. So um, maybe there, maybe there's a role even like in, in traumatic, you know, in trauma where there's a big bone defect. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, where the uh, especially like in, a, in a femur, where the vascularized bone flap alone would be tough because of the width of the bone defect, you yeah. can maybe reconstruct that. Yeah. Also, at the at the femur level, I think placing a, a lizard type frame is very very challenging. So I think that makes a lot of sense, and and it it's uh, obvious that you can get much better uh, rigid fixation using a capana technique than yeah. you could with just placing a fibula, because usually you just place screws across, you know. Uh, let's say the humerus through the fibula back through the humerus. So I think that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, Greg, I see that you're on. Uh, if you had any questions, go ahead. And there are a couple yeah. of questions online that I was going to ask after. J good. I, just along the, the questioning that you were talking about, you know, um, we're so concerned about closing, um, not having compression on pedicles and, and um, you know, when we're closing, that's one of the advantages of having the, um, the, the Doppler, the Venus mm -hmm. Doppler. But, you know, you're creating a hole in an allograft and stuffing bone inside there. Do you, I mean, how do you know how much bone, how, how much to core out and, and what is the, I don't have experience with that. I mean, how, how, how do you put it in there and how do yeah. you uh, make sure that you're not compressing everything, you know, that you're getting adequate flow distally and actually even venous outflow is the biggest problem. Yeah, so you, so you some, it's a turn and error, you know, so you'd core it out and see if the bone fits in uh, nice and easy. If yeah. you have like, if you feel like a hammer it in, obviously it's too tight. Right. It has fit, it has fit in pretty, you don't want to be too loose, but you know, it's kind of fit in nice and snug. And then, uh, and then you uh, uh, put the hole pre at the one end where the pedicle is, so you can easily bring it out. So it has right. to be everything has come out nice and easy. <clears throat> if it's a struggle, where you have, where you're pulling on it and you can see a kink, then obviously it's not a good thing. So it's a bit of a trial and error. So sometimes it takes multiple times to core out the core out the medulla of the uh, allograft. Just is, you know, uh, but do you ever take a clip off, say, the distal? perineal artery to see if there's flow you know through you know through your anastomosis through the pedicle out no, to the because uh, because the anastomosis is done at the end after bones already been fixated that's true. yeah so i can't really see them but you know you yeah. can't tell by the bone healing 
I guess if it was now vascularized, it wouldn't heal so rapidly. Mm -hmm. mm. True. Yeah. Yeah, bone blood supply. I know it's different than uh, <laughs> muscle and skin for us. I, I don't quite understand all of that. I guess you could like, if you wanted to, before you put it in, you could put a hepatitis saline into the proximal uh, uh, lumen and then squirt it to see if it comes out to the distal side. Right. Um, I do have a couple of questions online that I want to get to, hopefully. Um, so one question was about the earlier part of your talk when you were showing the mandibular recon reconstruction. The question is, when you have a, a complete loss of a hemimandible, including the TMJ, um, yeah. do you have any uh, tips or tricks on how to stabilize the neomandible with regards to um, the TMJ within the glenoid fossa? Yeah, so um, I give a head and neck talk, I think, at IMC. Uh, typically, um, with, you know, most of my experience with uh, a mandible are cancer, right? Not mm -hmm. trauma, but uh, so they are elderly people, they had radiation, all that. So our approach has been, it's still it, I still the same thing. We do not reconstruct uh, TMJ. As long as there's one one joint is intact, we, I will put the, let's say if, it, if it's just a posterior only defect, I don't even put vascularized bone, I just put soft tissue in there. And these people define, they have a, they have a good function, Having a bad TMJ reconstruction is worse than having no TMJ, right? Yeah. If you have bad, if you have bad joint, they can open their mouth, have pain, all kinds of stuff. So, and then if it's a total, let's say it goes from a contralateral uh, parasympathesis all the way down to the, you know, condyles going on the one side, I will put the fibula anteriorly up to the angle so they can have a shape. But the but the 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 ramus part, I will not put a bone there. But if I do put a bone, I mean, I don't know what the purpose would be except for the showing the aesthetic part we will not we will not shove it into the uh, uh glenoid fossa and all the all the into the into the uh, fossa there so we leave it open um somebody asked me somebody asked me what do you do when both you know if there's complete you know mandibles uh are gone from you know kind of kind i haven't ever had a case like that i don't, I don't know what i would do but uh um i think if you have a one good joint that should be sufficient. So uh, typically, we do not reconstruct. Now, in other cases, like trauma cases, young patients, uh, where it's not radiated, um, you know, if you're working with older maxillofacial surgeon, I know they do a lot of these little prostheses. I had one case not too long ago where our uh, oral surgeon uh, put a little prosthesis in there, and and then we put it on our in my uh, to my uh, fibula because it was uh, it was non malignant tumor, mm -hmm. and he did fine. He did fine. Uh, but that's like my end of very few. I really have don't have a huge, uh, huge experience doing that uh, for the most part. Great. And then just one last question from the comment section. Do you have any experience? Um, you showed that a fantastic calcaneal reconstruction with the free fibula. Do you have any um, experience or thoughts on using a, a pedicled ipsilateral fibula distally based for calcaneal reconstruction versus a contralateral microvascular transplant? I didn't use, I went to ipsilateral. When there's a bone defect, I always use the same leg. I figure like one bad leg is better than two bad legs. Yeah. So, uh, and then, yeah, I thought, you know, you could do, but I think it's actually easier just to do as a free flap. Yeah. yeah. Like free transplant. You just try to take it out and you hook it in. Then, because if you try to distally, then you got to turn the pedicle around. Yeah, you gotta open it all the way up. Then you're gonna have this little big soft, you know. Then you gotta somehow shove it in. It limits how you're gonna, it limits how you wanna be able to put the bone in where the skin panels are gonna be. It just cause creates a lot more problem. So I think a lot of times the simplest solution, mm -hmm. especially if you are a microsurgeon, transplant surgery, microsurgery sometimes much easier and simpler and quicker than trying to do these things pedically and locally and regionally, you know? And sometimes well, I, even faster, you know? <clears throat> yeah, I, I do agree. I think, um, you know, local or pedicled flaps, um, you have definitely less degrees of freedom and, and it requires a lot more careful planning versus you have a lot more freedom, obviously, when you do um, when you do a free flap. Well, David, thank you so much um, for being with us. This was a fantastic talk. We, um, interestingly enough, we yesterday we had a, Tom, we had a talk by Tom Hayakawa <laughs> on soft soft tissue reconstruction in sarcoma defects. Oh, oh okay. um, and so this actually is a perfect d dovetail um, to that because you've obviously covered the bony reconstruction and that. So I think it's a 
I'm very excited about having it as part of our library because I think it's a very important topic. So thank you again for uh, for being thank with you. us and for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe there, Northern California. Thank you. And please say hello, <laughs> hello to all of our friends in Chicago. Oh, well. oh, by the way, for those of you uh, who are still online, you know, as you know, that the WSRM is going to be postponed for the following year because of the, obviously, for all the travel restrictions and things like that. In June, we don't, we didn't really know what's going to happen. So I know an announcement uh, has been uh, sent out, but uh, it's going to be, in, it's going to be same, same location around same time, but for 2022 rather than 2021. And then, and then, and then it'll be followed by New York one year. So we will just continue on after that. We're not going to push everything forward, but so, you know, it'll just be a one year gap because, uh, it's, yeah. Got will it. you be the, uh, the president for that period of time? Well, so I'll be the president for the meeting yeah. in terms of uh, whether I should, you know, I'm happy. To, so we are discussing that right now. So, uh, you know, um, I have a, I have offered to, I will to just give, give to next president for the uh, following year. Uh, but then of course the Cancun meeting will still be, uh, still be, I'm, I'm still the president for that meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah. But you know, it's, it's, we got time. So we're discussing that. Good. And actually, Very while good. I have people on the line still, um, uh, I just want to make an announcement. Tomorrow, same time, 7 a.m. Pacific time, we are delighted to have Dr. Bob Walton, also from Chicago. Um, oh, yeah, he'll uh, be given, the next given us a, yeah. Give, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Speaking of which, and, and also he's given us a talk on, on his experience with nasal reconstruction. The details are, are posted online on our website, and I will also post it on the IMC website on Facebook. So thanks again for joining us. David, great to see you. Hopefully, we'll get to see you Thank in you. person next. Yeah. All right, take care. Great, thanks. Bye -bye. Take care. Thanks, David.